sorry, we, we, I'm just uh, getting to uh, a command of the technology uh, here at my new home. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome uh, Martin Meltzer from the CDC. Uh, been there since '95. Never learned my lesson. It's, I mean, yeah, I, I'm like, you know, I, I'm a, you know, a, a vagabond academic uh, who just moves from place to place every five or six years. So, uh, so Martin's uh, stickability to do great work at one place is is, is uh, impressive. But I, I you know, I, I don't know quite how you manage it. I, maybe it's because you don't make, uh, you don't irritate people the way I do. After and I have to move on. And people like you. you see, I think that might be an explanation. So Martin has very kindly agreed uh, to come and talk to us about his work at CDC. Uh, he heads up the the Health Economic Modelling Unit there and has done for a long time. Uh, has just got unrivaled experience in uh, public health modelling, uh, and we're just uh, really fortunate to be able to take the, the, the serendipity of him visiting his in-laws here uh, in the Edmonton area to, uh, to get him to come and give us a seminar. So I'll shut up and get out of the way. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. So good morning and thank you very much for the very kind invitation. Um, so when I offered to, to give a talk and, and we're discussing topics, I suggested this one simply because I like to spend some time thinking about and spent my 22 plus years at CDC practicing the idea of integrating economics and the requisite math modeling that goes with it into the discipline that is uh, public health. And one of the great lessons that I've learned over time is that simple models are what is needed or what is required in order to make the connection is a question of we're sitting on one side of the, the canyon as health economists and the other side is the number of other disciplines that make up public health, your medical doctors, your laboratorians, your specialists in communications, for example. And if we want to engage them, if we want to provide information that will help them, we have to cross over and talk in their language. They are unlikely, for obvious reasons, to come over and start learning health economics. Uh, and in fact, we would advise them very often, don't try it. it. You really, really don't want to do that. It's not good for one's mental health. We do a lot of math modeling in public health uh, because of the lack of data. People are sometimes find it very difficult to believe because nowadays we live in uh, the age of huge data banks of people visiting the doctor's office or going into hospital and the requisite, of course, financial papers and charges that nobody really understands. We all use them, but how they actually made, nobody made up, nobody knows. But they, people believe that there's a large number of amount of data there, and in fact, everything should be re reduced to a statistical analysis or even a, just, just a descriptive analysis just with a few numbers, and why do we need math models? And truth, most of the time, you do not have in public health, my experience, sufficient data to just do a simple statistical analysis. You have to rely upon building models. And again, the analogy of different islands of data from different populations at different times, uh, perhaps from different cultures. And what you're trying to do with a math model is make connection between those islands and build a structure and say, if I make these extrapolations from these data sets and you accept that, here's what the situation might look like. There are, of course, and I spend a lot of time, uh, people who aren't trained too much in math models spend a lot of time being uh, amazed at the amount of jargon used to describe different math models. They think that there's a lot of importance in the way that one describes a math model. Uh, I'd like to tell them not so much. Uh, there's a wide variation, of course, as this audience knows, in complexity in math models. But there's also, therefore, a wide variation in usefulness. And usefulness, the key part, we don't decide what's useful. The key part is that the, the, this audience would agree with me, I think we call them clients. I run what I consider almost like an internal consulting shop. People come to the door. We do very little in terms of setting our own agenda. People come to us with problems. We work with them. And what do policymakers come when, want when they come to our door? They want answers, of course. And very often they want answers that meet predefined opinions. This is no surprise, they're as human as us. Uh, they definitely want options. They want to know, what if I change the dial here? 
What if I move this? What if we vaccinate this group rather than that group first? What happens? Um, and they, the important part that was really a stunning lesson to me initially was they want it for their situation. So, for example, if I do a study that says for the whole U.S. about vaccinating against influenza, well, that's very nice. But the first thing when the uh, state epidemiologist from, say, California, not to pick on California too much, calls, they don't want to know about the, the whole U.S. They want to know what would happen in California if they did or did not vaccinate against influenza. It's no different, I believe, in Canada. The Minister of Health in Alberta really doesn't care what happens in Toronto, and you might say, well, for good reason too, but the Minister of Health is interested in the citizens of Alberta and what happens to the citizens of Toronto. Well, there's some interest, obviously, but not a whole lot. And they definitely want to be able to readily compare any answers you provide to their intuition and you go back to, does the answer you provide meet their preconceived notions? And if it doesn't, that's where you spend most of your time explaining. And that's probably the most important part of your job as a modeler and economist to explain why an answer might not meet what they really wanted to hear or thought they should have heard. What is not needed is a black box. If you're going to have this kind of conversation, inputs and outputs, just to say, well, trust us, model is good, is a mistake. By the way, and I show this to the millennial generation, they have no idea where this picture comes from. So I always say, if you don't know this movie, go see it. It is the ultimate black box, as I'm concerned, in the 20th century um, culture. And it's the same in mathematical modeling. I do want to emphasize right up front, when I say simple modeling, and people, of course, in this room, and, and when we taught, teach at universities, and we have our postdoctoral fellows, you spent a decade or more filling up your toolbox, toolbox with various ways to take data and mash it and beat it and pulp it and get it in to confess. And here I'm saying, you know, simple models built in a spreadsheet is probably the best way to go in many, many instances, not all the time. And especially the younger generation say, wait, you just told me I spent 10 years wasting my time. It's not actually true. There's a difference between simple and simplistic. The difference is how much stuff variables you put in the model. There is no, of course, as you know, a formula that defines what is simple and simplistic. The difference is in the eye of the beholder. The key part, of course, is that you're not the beholder. It is the policy makers and the people that you're talking to. Very often they get, in fact, when you say, here's a simple model in the spreadsheet, and they still say, well, there's 20 input variables. That sounds complicating. And you said, yeah, but we threw out another 50. Uh, so simple is very is a is a term that is not definitive. It is not objective. It is more simple. Is more uh, subjective, and that you will find, or I found over time, that in fact the art of producing a simple model is actually one that requires a lot of thinking, a lot of rigor, and a lot of understanding of what is the essential elements that you're working on. It is not something that you learn in a semester in the classroom. I want to just illustrate with an old, old example. And the reason I do it is because I think it's one of the simplest models I've ever built, but the one most, uh, most interesting because of the re reception cat. This goes back to Lyme disease. I think everybody here knows it's a tick-borne disease. The interesting part, of course, is the ticks that transmit it are very small, and this makes them very difficult sometimes to detect on your body. Walking in the woods, and we have lots of fine wooded areas around Edmonton. Um, and you walk in the woods and you can literally come out with a tick on you without realizing it and only find out later or before you start panic to transmit Lyme disease, ticks have to be attached to you for about 24 hours. So if you catch it quickly, the chances of you getting Lyme disease are very low. So once you go for a little walk in the woods with your sweetie, you come back, you can check each other for ticks. It's very romantic. Uh, this is the natural uh, host for the ticks, little white-footed mouse and white-tailed deer. You have both of these up here. And the equivalent other deer, elk, the odd moose, uh, polar bears, the exception that run around Edmonton. Uh, and actually, humans are the accidental dead end hosts. Humans do not transmit Lyme disease from one to another. And it's only because we interfere into this ecology that we in, end up having ticks on us that actually get the disease. Right. So, what is Lyme disease for those who don't? She has a patient with one of the outcomes. This is Bell's palsy. You notice his fa her face is somewhat skewed to one side. That's because literally she's got frozen muscles. That's the way I like to describe it. The clinicians don't necessarily like that technical description. 
Uh, it will normally, most of the time, over months, uh, rectify itself and um, become mostly uh, fixed, as it were, adjusted. Some patients, it doesn't. This is one of the less serious outcomes, in fact, from Lyme disease. Over time, we have seen uh, patients get what they believe long-term sequelae, particularly arthritis and cardiovascular type problems associated with Lyme disease. Uh, the trouble is that many of those patients, there is no evidence at the moment of having them been infected with Lyme disease. So whether Lyme disease is the cause of it or just merely the trigger that caused some underlying condition, it is a, a, a problem of great interest amongst that group and particularly amongst people researching these long-term sequelae. How common is Lyme disease? I show this graph because this is the one when we built the original simple, simple model that we showed to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Pro, uh, Policy, uh, ACIP, and that is a committee that is formed under the auspices of CDC. It is staffed, or the committee members are placed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services by invitation. CDC members only act ex officio, they do not vote. And these committee members sit around and make votes and recommendations about the use of a vaccine. Who should get it, when they should get it, under what conditions. It is, I emphasize, only a recommendation. CDC only has one unit that actually makes regulations and enforces it. That's the people who do quarantine at the borders. The rest of us use the bully pulpit. What CDC recommends has a lot of weight, but there's no ways that we can enforce that recommendation or the nagging. The best public health tool of all, NAG. Right now, in, in more recent years, the number of reported cases of Lyme disease is probably in the 20 to 30,000 cases per year. And some of my colleagues have done some research that suggests that's probably a degree of underreporting is probably in the region of five to ten times underreporting. So perhaps as many as 300 cases, 300,000 cases a year in the, in the U.S. Fortunately, most of the cases are easy to treat. And what happened back when we first built this model was a new vaccine was coming up for licensure for Lyme disease for humans. There, is, there was and still is one for dogs, but you can't use it on humans. Uh, and the question was, what should the ACIP make a recommendation regarding who should get vaccinated and when and under what conditions? And built a simple little decision tree. Why a decision tree? Because you put this up, and it's pretty easy to explain to the audience. You read decision trees, as you know, in this audience from left to right. Are you going to vaccinate, yes or no? Will you get Lyme disease? No. Hopefully, if you're vaccinated, the answer is no, no matter how you're exposed. But vaccines do have failures. Some people don't like to admit it. Uh, the company that made it initially tried to convince me that their vaccine was 100% effective. No, we don't believe that necessarily. Uh, and then there's a big difference in Lyme disease with early detection and early treatment. If you get Lyme disease, but go to the doctor and it's di diagnosed in the first four to eight weeks, uh, correctly diagnosed, and the treatment literally is a handful of doxycycline, $10, $20, that will cure about more than 90%, 95% of those who get it, and you're done. So early detection and early treatment is really critical. However, of course, you can have early detection treatment, and treatment can fail. Most of the time, as I said, it gets cases resolved, but you can get, as I mentioned earlier, a bunch of long-term sequelae from Lyme disease if it's not treated, detected and treated early enough. There are basically three groups, cardiac, neurological, and arthritis, arthritic. Um, now, even back then, when we presented this, the clinicians treating these patients said, oh, this is, this is way too simple, too simplistic. Cardiac, for example, there's at least 20, even back then, different subcategories. And I said, that, that's fine, I'm not going to argue with you. You're the experts, you seem to treat your patients. But as you all know, in decision trees, the one thing is that you need data. And the data in decision tree, the first part, is the probability. So what is the probability, uh, even if you don't get vaccinated and you don't have early, an early diagnosis and treatment, what is the probability of getting cardiac? And how does that probability, if you do get treated early but it fails, what are those probabilities? And the answer I got was, don't know. 
because every time you break out this into the 20 categories, you're going to have to provide me a probability for those situations. And of course, these were clinicians that saw patients, so they knew the probability. I see 10 out of my last 12 patients have this condition. But when you say, yeah, but that's in the universe of your patients, what's the denominator? And one of the biggest struggles with math modeling when you extrapolate data, you take data, extract data, and you want to extrapolate forward, is trying to figure out the correct denominator. So we simplified here saying simply because we didn't know the actual probabilities of all these different subcategories within these three broad categories of long-term sequelae. The other challenge we faced back then was, well, how long do they last before they mostly resolve? And therefore, obviously, what is the cost? Because that's what you're going to do is you're going to balance the cost of preventing this against the cost of vaccination. <clears throat> and then we ran into another problem because at that time, there were a lot of cases out there that fitted in there uh, into these groups, but nobody would could say, oh, the median length time span for these cases in each one of them was X years. We had to spend a lot of time with expert opinion, right? This is the one nice part about a, a simple model like that is that you can fit an expert opinion, which is about one step, one small step above the gutter. But it's what you do. But the advantage then is when you keep it really simple, and I just say I'm going to assume that cardiac problems last 10 years, I can quickly go in and say, gee, somebody suggested it might last 15 years. Let's put in 15 years and see what happens. I can play the what if very quickly and very easily. Often, since this was building a spreadsheet, it's been sitting right there. And that's a really good way to communicate. What we got here was we put in a lot of different probabilities. The, different prob the probability of getting Lyme disease varies enormously depending on, on where you live and what your habits are and what you do for work and what you do for recreation and leisure. Uh, the probability of diagnosing, correctly diagnosing and, and attempting early treatment also varies greatly. And at the time, when we did this, we did not know the cost of the Lyme disease vaccine. It was uh, still in licensure, and the company, of course, didn't tell us. There were, and at that time, three doses. Uh, day one, a month later, an initial license was a year later, where they, they later changed that to six months later. So this is the cost of vaccination for all three doses. $50 is, of course, as everybody knows here, even in the late 1990s, way over-optimistic. You are never going to get fully vaccinated with all three doses for $50. Forget it. That's the full, that's not just the cost of the dose, that's vaccination, admin costs, everything. So what we have here is two simple little graphs that show the impact by cost of vaccination for all three doses, the cost per case averted, and for two probabilities of Lyme disease. Given differences in the probability of correctly being of correct early diagnosis and successful early treatment. And what you see, of course, is that when your probability is less than 1%, when it's 0.5% per year, which is what at the time we thought most people in the US, particularly in the Northeast, faced. People out in the Southwest, where it's arid and dry, much lower. This type of people, 3% and greater, are those people who often work in the brush. Think of uh, power line technicians who walk up and down, the, you know, power lines working on them all the time on the telephone. Um, the Bell, Mar Bell in New, upstate New York said they regularly had 3 to 5% of their technicians of the year diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease because they're tromping around in the bush all the time. What you clearly see then is it depends upon your risk. So for economists, this is great. This is targeting, targeting, and we know who these people are so we can do it. It also suggests, when you look at this, that um, people talked about vaccine effectiveness. Perhaps it's not such the most important variable within the range study. Obviously, if the vaccine effectiveness was down to 30, it would be a different story. But with two simple graphs, two simple sets of graphs, I can really disseminate information regarding who is likely to benefit the most, and what are the biggest or most important drivers? What are the levers that are driving your model? Now, the one part that really does get some people upset when you do economics is they suggest, well, it has to be cost-saving. It has to be above this black line before we are recommended. Not so. Our job isn't to make a recommendation, do or do not vaccinate. Our job is to make some estimate of the impact of an intervention given some understanding of the problem you're facing. It does not mean to say that you do not recommend using the vaccine 
in this population, even if it does cost $200 or more to have them fully vaccinated. But just what I'm telling you is this is what it's going to cost. Do not assume or pretend or try to sell the idea that it will save money because I don't think it will. Does the question then that pass on to the policymakers, the policymakers now have information to say, is it worthwhile to make that recommendation given? And with some very simple graphs, we can identify the key public health implications, which is the value of targeting this new vaccine at the time by the risk of disease. And the other public health message was that there's a great deal of value in spending time educating both the public at risk, in areas where Lyme disease is quite common, and their attending physicians into thinking about Lyme disease as an early diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and thinking about testing and treating for it earlier rather than later. If you think you got bitten by a tick, you're having headaches, you have 60% of the time you get this bullseye red rash, go to the doctor earlier rather than later. It'll benefit you. That kind of education is another intervention that is a whole lot cheaper than some of the vaccination options. Doesn't mean to say you have to choose that over it, but it's definitely a public health intervention. So it's quite a bit of information from a very, very simple model. And that is the real value. Going on to influenza, I spent a lot of time in my career. I never planned it. Uh, when I first arrived at CDC, I wandered literally door to door, knocking, introducing myself, how am I to help? I made a mistake, say sometimes in jest, of knocking on the door of the influenza branch at that time, it's now a division, and said, can I help you? Man, they snaffled me and they dragged me and said, can you do something about helping us plan and prepare for the next influenza pandemic? This was 1995, remember. Pandemics, when do they occur? This is an interesting uh, little graph figure because everybody knows about the 68, 57, 1918 one, and of course not, and I leave this off because this is the actual source at the time was written before the 2009 pandemic, but there were previous pandemics and obviously settled on the impact of every pandemic and the time between each pandemic uh, varies greatly. But they wanted me to address issues like when will the next pandemic occur and particularly they wanted me to provide information to help policymakers understand the potential risk we are facing. At the time we did this, the US federal government's influenza pandemic preparedness plan was about 40 pages long with a lot of white spaces. What they wanted was a simple model that says, you've got to do better than that. We have got to be better prepared because if it comes, even a 68 type pandemic, it can be devastating. And we cannot just sit around and say, oh, we're caught, what a surprise, we didn't know these things happened. We clearly know these things happen. So we developed a over time, four different types of very simple models. They're still up on the web. People still use them to start initially working on uh, estimates of pandemic and getting that engagement, that essential engagement with public health policymakers. They are uh, on spreadsheet based. You can download them, change the numbers. You don't like our numbers, that's fine. Put in your own numbers and see what, what the answer is. See if it really changes. Sometimes people make a lot of fuss over a small number you change and say, does that change the conclusion? Obviously, in a model, every time you change a number, the answer is changed, the output. But does it change enough such that you're really going to change your policy? What happened, of course, as we all know, is that they had a pandemic in 2009. Did models help? And what type of models help best? And perhaps this audience knows, but it's always very, very essential to understand that it is difficult to understand the impact of influenza. It's difficult to go out in the street and measure and say, how many cases do we have and how severe? What happens to those people? Do they just stay at home or do they need to go to hospital? The reasons are many. Diagnostic tests were slow and inaccurate. They have improved since 2009 to some degree, but certainly in 2009, PCR-based tests were not the answer for everything. They did provide some help. Um, Patients often come in to the doctor after peak viral load. So making it difficult sometimes to actually pick it up, even with PCR. There's a lot of false negatives at the initial test. Uh, doctors often can test empirically. In the middle of a pandemic or even a bad flu season, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, that much you're going to treat it like a duck. To hell with tests. It's just a waste of time and money. Give the patient antivirals or you just tell them, take, go home. You're not in a high-risk group. We don't think this is life-threatening. Self-care, lots of fluids, lots of rest, take analgesics, call us, 
if it gets worse, right? So the doctors treat like that. They don't test for flu. They're going to write down on those little important sheets that go to finance and billing, viral unknown etiology, treat the same. So you don't know always the accurate count of people in the population who have flu and interact with the health uh, system, healthcare system. Uh, also, it's also true that a lot of people with flu fortunately have mild enough cases that they self-treat at home and they're just fine. In the US, we find through telephone-based surveys, about 50% of the people claim that they have an influenza-like illness. They don't know if it's true influenza and stay home because they're just fine. Box of clinics, some over-the-counter medications and watch element afternoon TV with a course of requisite televised and it's just fine. But from the policy point of view, maker's point of view. You want to know what's the real impact? So you've got to account for the underreporting. And what we did in 2009, we got lucky. We sent out somebody initially who'd worked in foodborne. And in foodborne, if you think there's underreporting in flu, you've, you've seen nothing yet till you get foodborne illnesses. And they went door to door in a few cities asking people in the early phases of the pandemic in 2009, did you have flu-like symptoms? Yes or no? They went into hospitals and reread charts from patients and recategorized those people they thought had flu had not been reported with flu. And we ended up with these pyramids that basically started with, for each reported case, by the time you take it, how many of them were tested for flu? Um, were they collected? Did they even have specimens collected? By the time we had correction factors, we got a multiplier for each case of reported flu. How many additional cases? Or what was the multiplication factor? that we would use to get an estimate of actual true cases. And this number here was 2.22. Tend to remember that we not all use it. And we used those multipliers in some very simple models to give updates of the number of cases, hospitalized, deaths, and uh, cases to the, uh, just clinical cases. Once a month, we put out a report. We went up every month on the CDC internet. The page is still up there as part of our archives. And this was the first time, pandemic or non-pandemic flu season, that we'd ever done this real time, or near real time, during a flu season. And situation awareness was one of the most important things for our policymakers at the time. Because normally we face, we have this, particularly back then, the sort of vague estimates and we have some ILI measures but we still don't necessarily have everything together in one simple package that says, here's a table, here's what we think the flu numbers are this past month. What do you think, though, when we started doing this and presenting it every month, what do you think the first thing our incident manager, the person in charge of CDC's uh, emergency response to the pandemic, what do you think he asked us? He was very nice, he loved this. What do you think was the first question he asked us when we started doing this? When will it end? Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, that was also true. That was the second question. We gave him, he liked the information. So this, we crossed that bridge and we're giving information that was useful to him and, and indeed a large number of policymakers up and down the, the, the spectrum of policymaking. And there's a large spectrum of policymaking in the US. It's a big country. Any other guesses? The, the one, when will it end, is a very good guess. And it was asked. It's the second question. The question was, well, this is once a month. Can you do it daily? Streaks of laughter from me and in my team because, yeah, we are limited by the data. And this is where you start saying, yeah, you could probably interpolate and make it daily or weekly. The trouble was that the data still takes time. In this day and age, a computerized and electronic health records and things like this still takes time to collect data on who was hospitalized with flu, which is one of our key indicators that we then multiplied out. Roughly, we have these sites, 10 sites around the US that we pay extra and they spend a lot of time documenting and testing more than most patients would. But it took about three weeks to get 80% of all their patients hospitalized with flu confirmed and sent forward to us. So we said, you know, every month. We, and we said, if we do it sooner, we are working on less and less data about who's flu and we'd have to do further extrapolations. And at what point do you stop making extrapolations? So we thought one month was stressing. By the way, if you think that Canada's every, any different, I've had some chats with Alberta Health, and no, even though everybody in Canada, it's simpler because you have mostly a one-payer system, it takes a while to get all the data from the hospital to the data banks to the point where you can extract and say, aha, in this week, there were X number of people hospitalized. 
you're not necessarily the moment you come in, you're not necessarily got a toe tag that says flu and we all agree with it. It can take time. Sort it out. One of the things we did then, we presented uh, data like this. This is the end of the pandemic and we gave it total. So it wasn't just the number of people with flu, it was by age groups because this is clearly children, adults are working, retirees mostly, um, deaths, hospitalizations and cases. And we also were able, with our very simple model, able to put a range. We had some data from different areas, different stations around the country that they provided different data. One of the things also that was very, very important was the post-pandemic, the post-mortem, I like to call it. There were some accusations. The people said that it wasn't a true pandemic because we, the CDC, will say things like the number of deaths in a non-pandemic flu season can range anywhere from, say, around 5,000 all the way up to 36,000, sometimes even more. So we said in this pandemic, oh, total deaths were with the number, uh, death, 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 oh, about 12,000 with perhaps an upper range of 18,000. That's not serious compared to serious non-pandemic seriousness. You were just, we were told, you were just trying to scare us. And in Europe, it got even worse. WHO were accused of uh, being in cahoots with the vaccine manufacturers, and that was all just a scheme and a scam to increase the sales of flu vaccine. Not true. By breaking it down by age group, we were able to demonstrate that the risk of death amongst children was <clears throat> about eight times the standard that we normally saw for this type of strain of vaccine in the previous decade. Uh, it's vaccines, it's flu strains. And for working age adults, it's actually closer to 10 times. And the question I have to people is who object and say, well, we just made a storm in the teacup and wasn't. How many kids must die before you've got an official plan? This type of data was very useful when the inevitable post-mortem, as I said, and the accusations are flowing around, the traditional states, etc. Finishing up now, um, the example of Ebola. This is CDC's emergency operations room. This is, not too clear here, my apologies. But this is the daily, in, because of Ebola, we had a daily briefing of the incident manager. This is the incident manager with her back, with her back to you. That's Dr. Inga Damon, one of the world's foremost experts on smallpox, and now one of the foremost experts on Ebola. Uh, what's interesting is around this table and around the edges are people of, of team leads, various the clinical, the logistics, and there's now always, as part of um, the planning and, and setup, there's now a seat reserved for modern. Modeling has moved from something that's sort of interesting and maybe we can help to it's recognized that we can and actually need to provide data because you can't get data from the field, reliable data, fast enough to make all the decisions. What do modelers, what do the leadership want from modelers in this type of situation? They want to know how many cases, how bad is it? That's what makes the news. They also want to know what would be the impact of interventions. So the first one is without interventions, how bad can it be? And this is if we do something and there's a menu, what would happen? And then there was that question you mentioned, of when will it end? I always find this hilarious. You know, day one, I got asked in on August the 3rd, came in August the 4th. First question, one of the first questions I got is, when do you think it will end? Like, you know, if I knew if I was that good, I'd be on Wall Street raking in the dollars. But they do want to hear about it. Politicians want to get up and say things like, it'll be over by Christmas. It has a certain ring to it. It sells. It helps control panic. Our job is, yeah, try not to make it so black box. Try not to convince them that, yes, they're correct. Try to tell them the upsides and downsides of making such statements. By the way, I did say, I think can, if we follow it, if we move fast, it'll be ready. We will be way on the downside in Liberia by Christmas. Do not guarantee it would be over by Christmas. And it wasn't, but it was definitely under control by Christmas. I'd like to play a short clip from one of our clients, all right? So you know you're in the business, you might think that we have clients. The best advert for how well your models are helping leadership is for your clients to actually tell you that. We have a little clip up from you. In 2014, the world experienced its first Ebola epidemic. It was like nothing we had ever seen. It spread rapidly through densely populated cities, countries, and an entire region. But we needed to do more. At CDC, 
we make decisions based on the best available science. CDC scientists projected that without any intervention, there could have been as many as 1.4 million cases of Ebola in Liberia and Sierra Leone. This was done based on a model that showed four things. First, cases were doubling every three weeks, setting the stage to turn a crisis into a catastrophe. Second, time was lives. Progress needed to be made in hours and days, not weeks and months. Every month of delay would triple the number of cases. Third, the tipping point was at least 70% safe care of patients and safe burial for those who died. Finally, if we could reach that 70% figure, cases would plummet just as quickly as they had risen. The prediction mirrors what actually happened over the following months. In Liberia, the number of cases we predicted would occur if we took rapid action was very close to the number of cases that actually were reported and estimated to have occurred through mid-January. The model showed not only what could happen and what should happen, it also predicted what did happen. This finding guided actions of CDC, the U.S. government, the World Health Organization, and the affected countries and communities to provide safe burial and safe care for patients with Ebola. This rapid action broke the back of the epidemic, and it also demonstrated modeling's role during an outbreak response. the director of CDC at the time of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, and he was, without a doubt, one of our biggest clients. We produced a very simple model. It's called Ebola Response. It's in the spreadsheet. You can go to the CDC's webpage, do a Google, get it, download it, play with it, see what I mean. The key part was we kept it simple. There were a lot of, lot of critiques and complaints. A lot of people did not like this steep line the 1.4 million, because they said, oh, it's simple, it's simplistic across the barrier between simple and simplistic. You haven't put in anything about uh, the population changing their behavior. And I said, well, that's fine. How much behavior is going to change? Well, in previous uh, outbreaks up and down Africa, they said, yeah, but all those outbreaks had an intervention. So how do I differentiate what would have happened in those outbreaks with or without the intervention? Not possible. This isn't nicely controlled lab-based experiments with and without case-controlled, random-controlled trials. Don't have that. The other part about this 1.4 million is that it included an estimate for underreporting, which I always thought, still do, that it was terribly important because if you underreport, underestimate the number of cases, you're going to have, naturally, Congress and donors are not going to give you as much money, stuff, staff, and money that you need. You do not want to arrive in Liberia with not enough stuff. And you do not want to suddenly scramble around saying, oh, we need 10 times more people than we realize from the start. For reasons I don't quite understand, because everybody, WHO onwards, every academic, every uh, donor agency, every public health official we ever talked about, readily admitted there was underreporting. They just didn't seem to want to consider what degree of underreporting and how that might affect. And the part, of course, that the press did not report was, yes, you might have this if you did nothing and nobody changed their behavior. We were careful to put that part in. But if you did something, you could actually make a huge difference. And it's this gap that, of course, caught the policy of makers' eyes. I said, wait, are you guaranteeing that you can do this? I knew, as did my colleagues, from day one, we knew how to stop this. Why? Because we'd done it before. The only difference here was scale. And scale meant we had to, bigger scale, we had to move faster, we had to move bigger. Having said that, we were pretty sure that so long as we could get the same interventions going that worked previously, we would stop this. And that was the message that, that the policymakers with their hands on their purse were really interested. We give you the resources, can you make this happen? Yes. This is an interesting graph. Dr. Frieden mentioned in this little video clip there. And what's interesting there from my point of view is that when we did the first draft, this wasn't in it. He came back to us and said, I want to say to Congress and to the public, every day's delay cost will cause so many cases. So we promptly laughed again and said, the accuracy of the data coming out of West Africa is not going to allow us to go to one-day time steps. We can do it per month, and we drew that and said, that's about as close as I can get you in a simple model without going silly on the extrapolation. And he said, that'll do. And we made it. Cool. No more 
a cease message to Congress and the policymakers and the people of Burma having another commitment, time for action, because time costs case. And again, demonstrating that we were within about 23% of what uh, our, our predictions were within 23%, our five and a half months ahead of schedule were within 23% of what happened. The part that people will say, well, you could be more accurate. You know what? Accuracy is not what it's about. Increased accuracy does not necessarily translate into better public health. It's a fact that some people just go, oh, particularly when they go back and they like to what beat me over the head with this. We could have made this more accurate. It would not have changed what we did. Why? Because public health think of it as like a dashboard with dials that you move around, move stuff, move people, try to get people to change the behavior. It's actually those dials are not precise. They tend to move in big slob. The one classic case I like to think about is HIV testing. So from an economics and modeling point of view, if you want to catch the greatest number of HIV cases, you go test the high-risk groups, men having sex with men. And generally, the younger generation in places that you know do not make the front pages necessarily, but increase the risk. In fact, unfortunately, in Atlanta, we're experiencing that same explosion amongst increased HIV cases amongst young black men. And of course, culture and what have you, they're not talking to anybody else about that. So we could try go out and test more young black men. What would happen, as I'm sure you're guessing, is that we'd get such a pushback. We'd be stigmatizing that group. So in order to get them, we have to spread out and wide and talk about testing everybody. An example of, yes, we have an intervention, but we can't so precisely laser accurately pointed at just one high risk group. It's where policy and economics and modeling diverge. Increased accuracy, once again, does not necessarily mean, increased accuracy of the modeling does not necessarily mean better policy. What is better is that the policymakers understand the variables that go into the model, and the variables that go out, and what you did in the mixing bowl and how you scaled it up. And yes, Dr. Friedman is unusual. Gave him a lot of credit. He really spent a lot of time understanding. He even took the model, but he said, after a while, I just want to see the graphs. That's fine. But you'd rather have that engagement than somebody saying, thank you for these numbers. I don't understand them. And you put them on the desk to your left and make your decisions the way they did beforehand. This is, and he mentioned it in his little video clip, the single most important number that we gave him. People focus on the 1.4. It wasn't. This said, what is your target that you have to aim for? 70%. Put 70% of all known cases either in Ebola treatment units or when those are filled up, or there were times when there was room in the Ebola treatment unit in cases. They knew there were cases. Their family knew there were cases. But they refused to go to the Ebola treatment unit for a variety of reasons. But at least then he said, at home, have restrictions, restrict access to the patients, and prevent onward transmission on safe burial when needed. Get to that figure, 70% of all the patients at that, it will bend the curve. It's the terminology we use. It resonated with the public health. And by George, it worked, just as Dr. Friedman said. It's not the only modeling we do. People think that was all we did. We did spend some time talking about where would Ebola, or what was which district that had previous had cases was at risk of having an Ebola case within the next month, and particularly across the borders into Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Mali, and of course, Cash, we worried a lot about in Nigeria. Uh, but Dr. Friedman wants to maintain our luck is great in terms of controlling the outbreak, is that we stopped it from spreading in Nigeria when it went there for a few cases. What this graph uh, pictogram shows is that these yellow parts are all the districts in the three countries that had a case, one or more cases of Ebola at that point in time. And then it's a heat map. The more red it is, the greater the danger of an Ebola case being reported. We very simply calculated this. Part of it was just the distance from the center, centroid of the population in one district that had Ebola to the centroid of population in the district without um, Ebola. And our colleagues did not like this because they had experience and they said, oh, the roads that go there, they go like this and they're full of mud and it's not a straight line and it just doesn't work. Turns out this is pretty accurate. Uh, we were able to up there. Mali, we said, hmm, you want to watch 
uh, the capital of Mali because the matter of a few cases did occur here. In some ways, it's no big secret in my mind. But we produced it. The one group of people that really liked this and kept asking us for more was the military, both the British and the US military demanded more of it. To them, this made sense. And they understood that, yes, we're making a simplification, but its simplification seemed to be working well enough for them to begin to say, we need to watch and be really prepared here. Yeah, perhaps not so much over here. Note there is one in the Dachau, no information relevant to this that we could put in. Mm. And that always did worry me. I also spent a lot of time saying, did our interventions work? I'm trying to check that we're putting in all this money, unprecedented. Over three billion dollars of aid went to all those three West African countries and other Angola was one. Unprecedented. That the budget of some country for the entire country to come up. Are we getting bang for the buck? We used our model again and began to work out and said, yeah, without Ebola treatment unit, all community care centers, these were centers in the community, people who couldn't or wouldn't go to the center to the ETUs, they could take their sick relative there and in a more isolated area, one member of the family only would stay and look after them and this would reduce and did reduce the onward transmission. Without them, this is the type of cases you would have with both of them together and then between you broke out down to just one or the other. The beauty of a simple model, I've got simple switches, I can switch it one on, off. Uh, so what did we really contribute? We've got size of outbreak before the interventions. We really emphasize the value of this now. You don't know the degree of underreporting. Pay some attention to it. I had the hardest time talking, getting some people to spend some time thinking about that. But in the end, they began to realize it. Perhaps people often spend time in a model saying what is known. What you really want to know for decision makers is how thin is the ice that they're skating on. And making decisions is really important. How secure are they about understanding what's going on? what could be the impact for it on the future. What are some of the lessons that we've learned over time doing this, inter this uh, response and other ones being integrated into the response leadership system? You have to be accessible. Modeling done best when you're just down the hallway. That five minute conversation in the hallway, that quick email, that midnight phone call, I'm not kidding you. Uh, back and forth is way better than a thick report. Thick reports don't get written, particularly when they're dashing from one meeting to the other and the pressure's on, why is it this? And little things are getting in the way every day. Fast and frequent outbreaks. Always getting more data from the field. What often happens, oh, people come in and they think they've got something really new and they provide you with, oh, we haven't seen this data, nobody else has seen this data. It's actually more irritating because you're thinking if somebody's able to come to you and say this data hasn't been reported elsewhere, you know there's actually a breakdown in the data reporting system. But if you put it in, it doesn't make a difference. You want to be able to quickly update your model. Simple models, again, we put this model up in the first month, first couple of weeks on the web. It's still there, you can look at it. Transparency, ability for others to play around, ability for others to look at what you did and criticize and say, yes, that part's good, that's bad, it's all bad, our model's better, whatever. That's how you talk to the public. That's how you talk to leaders. So I have some quick 10 rules here, but you know what? Let's stop it there and take time for questions. the bottom of all of that. <laughs> ah, an excellent question. So the question for those listening in, the question is, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a hierarchy of evidence when we look at uh, biomedical, perhaps say for a drug, starting at randomized control trials and working our way down. Mathematical modeling isn't usually placed in that hierarchy. Where would I, A, would I place it in there, and B, where would I place it? I think, yes, it should be placed there. Um, 
it's an intriguing idea to have it formally placed. In fact, it is there because as you certainly go down from the more carefully controlled trials to the idea of, say, case control trials, you're beginning to get into the world of mathematical modeling because there's always at some part, some section that you're missing. I do think it would be a very good idea, in fact, to put it in the hierarchy. Um, the problem is when you say math modeling, what do you mean? It would be a very loose type of definition because, as I said earlier, there's so many different types of math modeling. But I think it's a reality, particularly in public health. Many times everybody wants the random controlled trial because that way they think they've controlled for all the variables that are important. But most of the time in public health, you do not have that luxury. You do not have the money to run it. And in fact, the ILDs would never let you not vaccinate that group or uh, withhold standards of care from this group. So you can't have it. There, there is a need to have it. I think it would be a really good idea. I'd place it below random control trial, definitely. Uh, well run observation case control type study. Uh, though there again, you're going to find some of these case control studies have an element of modeling in it. Uh, and probably somewhere around equal to an observational study, whatever. And that term again is pretty loose. And the reason is because to do a good math model, you spend a lot of time, if you do it well, thinking about the data and what does it say and what doesn't it say and what's good to extrapolate and what is too much. Thank you. Anything else? Um, no, actually, that, that's one of the fallacies. We teach a lot with decision trees because just as I showed in my first example, it's very, very simple. It's a way to do it. Decision trees are a way to force people who don't normally think in shocking but true. Not everybody goes around thinking of probabilities and models. But it demonstrates the, the understanding of the minimum type of data you need to probability. You can't just say, oh, there's more than one type of cardiac problem with Lyme disease. To really analyze and look at the costs and benefits, you have to understand the probabilities. So they understand the value. So it's a very good way. But a lot of the models, um, I don't think it's a very good idea to say we only do or we focus on that. Ebola response actually is a, a diff not a differential, it's a difference model. Again, the simple part. Differential equations look great in a very well-learned peer-reviewed journal that's not read by a lot of po policymakers, but looks good with just equations. But can simplify it to differences, just bigger time steps, really. And you can put that into a spreadsheet very, very easily. And that's what, for example, I think you should be flexible. Whatever works is what you should use. Worry less about naming the type of model and worrying about is it meeting the criteria of what your policy makers want. Any questions from the uh, viewing audience? None? Oh, very kind to me. They've all gone to sleep. Yeah, so, certainly so. I, I mean, uh, the principle of, of, of making the decision that you randomize. No. Uh, the, the group that was talking about the uh, cross-cut decision. Mm -hmm. uh, Cross the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> the issue is how you add uncertainty to the decision. So how do you get the decision makers to really understand uh, that uncertainty? Right. So. Well, I, I, I think that's absolutely part of the challenge and deciding it. And I think, again, it, we like to think, particularly when we've done enough, again, the 10 years of collecting our toolkit, and we like to think of calculating 95% confidence intervals and ever more complex ways of doing that better and better, and that's fine. But in many cases, you won't have the data and all the time. Policymakers actually don't, a lot of them don't necessarily like uncertainty in the numbers. They just want a number. LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, uh, once yelled at some economist who came to the door and said, don't give me ranges, ranges are for cattle. And of course, LBJ is an ex-cattleman. Damn well knew that. Um, the haberdasher uh, also said, give me a one-armed economist so they don't go in the one hand and in the other hand. So he... The idea of being uncertain, we like to think it's very central. A lot of decision makers, we should realize, actually accept the idea that you've given an estimate, it's your best job. They're, they're most, many policymakers, in my opinion, are actually quite kind to us in that they assume we've done the best job we can with the best data available. And they realize there's uncertainty, but they just want to know what's your best guess, what do you recommend the number we use. 
what I think you're saying in terms of uncertainty is it's actually our job to say how thin is the ice. This could be half, or this could be double of that, and we want to convey that. And there is sometimes tensions. Simple graphs like I showed, just saying, oh, if you assume this, so we big change of the dial. What's not helpful is doing small changes. Uh, very often people are focusing on one, like the cost of the vaccine, and you say, in this particular model with everything, the cost of the vaccine within this range actually doesn't make a big difference in your decision space. Of course, the numbers change as you change that value, but in terms of the conclusions you're likely to make, that's not going to change. They actually like that part. They actually like that kind of discussion, but you realize that takes a lot of time. You've got to engage them first and then get it. So sometimes you might simplify the model and just say, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty, and then you put in the appendix different graphs and tables showing what happens if you twiddle the dials on your model. And then hopefully that it's not always them, it's the aides get to that appendix and start asking questions. When they ask you questions like that, what is, happens if you change things, which is the, uncertain, the way they talk about uncertainty, you know you've got them. You know you're having that dialogue. If they don't talk about that, then it's actually either very worrying they trust you too much, or in fact they haven't read the thing at all, and they're just going to make the decision anyway. No other further questions? Oh, that was cheap and easy. I think it's okay. Thank you.